We're here at the Wellstone Memorial site at a plaque that is devoted to a narration as to how the crash came to occur. The crash which took the life of the senator, his wife and daughter, three aides and the two pilots. According to the plaque, Wellstone's plane departed St. Paul's Holman Field at 8.30 a.m. Just before 10 a.m., the plane descended toward the Eveleth Airport. According to the crash report produced by the National Transportation Safety Board, the plane was flying too low and too slowly as it turned into the final approach. The plane drifted off course, began a rapid descent, and crashed into the woods. The NTSB report concluded that the crash was caused by pilot error. Pilot error, that's what it says here in this place. There was a crash, the plane came down too slow, too low, it was pilot error. And I don't buy it. A preemptive, go it alone strategy towards Iraq is wrong. I oppose it. That death changed the direction of the country and possibly of the world, maybe irrevocably. And, and still we can't talk about Paul Wellstone's death. I flew in on October 25th, 2002, that morning, shot the VOR DME Alpha approach off the Hibbing VOR and landed on runway 9 with no difficulty weather-wise. The ceiling was 800 feet. Visibility was three miles. I seen the airport at least three miles away, so there was there was no no problem whatsoever for me anyway. I watched this twin turboprop come through this area and split these two big jack pines to your west there. I've never experienced a plane coming over my trailer house that low of an elevation or that slow of a airspeed. When I heard the shot, the first gunshot, it was a matter of a couple seconds, and I heard the second gunshot. Then it was just a very short time, and I heard three or four or five shots. They were so rapid I couldn't tell you. It was boom, 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 boom. I had originally thought that the popping noise may have been gunfire, but when I re-examined the, the issue, I thought that the popping may have transpired from the aircraft itself. At first it was boom, boom, and then it was three or four quick ones. Boom, 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 boom. When I noticed the airplane pass my trailer heading west, the airplane was cocked to the right, but it was still flying in a straight motion like this. So, you know, if you see an airplane cock, you'd think it would follow that pattern, but that this particular airplane, that's the first time I've ever seen this, that it was kind of sideways, but it kept going in that straight directional motion. If you got a, say you got a 20 knot crosswind blowing from the right side, you'd probably, you'd probably be five, five, 10 degrees crab to that side to keep the airplane lined up with the runway. But that morning, I don't think there was any, hardly any wind that I can remember. There was no wind. It was just kind of one of those little hazy, foggy days, but very calm. The airplane would look to, to be, you know, perfectly level. It's kind of cocked sideways like this and flying in a straight line. Probably 1040, 1045, somewhere in there. And I, I got the airplane out and actually got, got going in it. I looked over to the south. I saw some smoke. When I first looked at it, it looked nothing unusual. It just looked like... Um, somebody was probably burning brush or something in the backyard. I figure, well, I'm up here anyhow. I'll go take a look and see what, see what it is. Visibility was about five miles, so I had good visibility underneath. I went a little bit further, looked at it again. Uh, well, it just didn't seem like the right color. The color of the smoke, after a second glance and a third glance, it, was just, it just didn't seem seem right. I mean, it seemed to be the wrong color. Aviation kerosene does burn uh, with, with the black smoke. I talked to people afterwards and they said, 
oh, it was black. Well, no, it wasn't black. It was kind of like a, uh, a bluish gray color of smoke. Bluish white smoke, interestingly, is not the kind of smoke you get from uh, airplane fuel, which is kerosene based, which is black and coarse. It was a kind of smoke you get from an electrical fire. I do remember watching a, uh, some magnesium burn out there, and it was a uh, super bright, immense uh, white light, and that could have had something to do with the bluish white smoke. It looked to be whitish, bluish smoke that was coming up, uh, similar to the smoke that you would get in an electrical fire. The fuselage section was, uh, you couldn't even tell it was a fuselage section anymore. It was so well engulfed in flames that uh, it uh, pretty well melted down. The FBI took little to no interest in anything that I had to say. The local police were not involved, knew nothing. They, in fact, some of the police told me they are, uh, were told not to be involved. They had no involvement in this whatsoever, and uh, they couldn't even direct me as to where to go. It seemed like they had already made up their mind on how the crash had occurred, so anything that I had told them was kind of irrelevant. Do not discuss this with anybody. If something comes of this, we will be in contact with you. The white van 2002 Ford come whipping by here. The FBI dismissed it as just something else I had told them. It was like, you know, oh, it's not important. And, you know, the fellow said, I'll get back to you if anything comes of this. And I was never led to believe that there was an investigation into this. We lost not only Paul's voice, but the enthusiasm and the message he carried from us ordinary folks. And of course, and that translates into the national arena and even the international arena where Paul spoke against CAFTA, the trade agreements, all of those issues that are going to hurt us as Americans. And Paul was our voice. The early support he got from up here, uh, you know, helped launch his uh, career, Senate career. I mean, he was well liked when he ran for uh, state auditor back in 1982. Now, Minnesota is traditionally a liberal state, but it's also traditionally a state that has a record of going, going Republican. And he had a, you know, Wellstone had, had a remarkable way about him as far as being a communicator that a lot of career politicians don't have. Again, you know, Wellstone's not a career politician. He was some wacky college professor who got a school bus and a bunch of volunteers and drove around the state and showed that you can actually stand up against a, a moneyed political machine. He was the only person in the Senate willing to go on offense for the labor movement. Here it was only uh, 10 days before the election. Paul Wellstone had been pulling, pulling ahead. He was six or seven points uh, ahead of, of Norman Coleman, the f former mayor of St. Paul, who was the hand-picked candidate of the Bush administration. As his points went up in Minnesota instead of um, going down after his speech, uh, his powerful speech against the, uh, the, the Iraq war, prophesizing really many of the things that um, are now happening in Iraq. Authorizing the preemptive, go it alone use of force right now, which is what the resolution before us calls for, in the midst of continuing efforts to enlist the world community to back a tough new disarmament resolution on Iraq could be a very costly mistake for our country. This one death flipped the U.S. Senate from Democratic control to Republican control, essentially. And it happened, you know, it happened with a mysterious small plane crash. And parts of the fuselage itself, this, the framework and the sheeting were, you know, were melting because of the intense heat. What was the source of energy that decenerated, or just completely destroyed the fuselage? But we don't have any materials analysis of the fuselage. We don't know whether they tested for any incendiary devices, whether they tested for bombs, whether they tested for strange elements. We have no uh, indication of any search for uh, an explanation of why this fuselage burnt so fiercely. Again, what was the source of this tremendous amount of energy that 
just turn the fuselage into a molten piece of metal. The wings, which were the principal location for fuel tanks for this aircraft, separate from the rest of the crash, where the fuselage burned intensely for hours, but not the wings. Personally, myself, I thought it was in a fuselage due to the, fl the fire. I don't remember the wings, uh, you know, burning or nothing. The wings contain the fuel, but there's really no explanation about, about why the fuselage would, would burn down to ash. That's why I heard the, the radio call, their initial call, that they were out for the for inbound on the VOR approach. Speaking to the controllers and, and over the radio at the Eveleth Airport, the pilot's words were crisp, there wasn't slurred speech, wasn't intoxicated in a sense because of chemicals, fumes, or whatever it might be. I hear the click of the of the microphone seven times, which keys the lights up, brings up brings them up to a higher intensity. They never made any transmission of uh, distress, either to the airport, which there was a, a local frequency that they'd communicated, we're coming in, we're seven miles out, and then they turned on the aircraft, the, uh, the runway landing lights with the microphone, uh, so we know that that was working when they were out there, but when they got into trouble, there was no communication from, from either pilot even though it looks as if this, this airplane was, was just above the trees for quite some time. A Duluth City employee who was traveling to the same funeral that was drawing Paul Wellstone was near the airport and received a very peculiar cell phone call. At about 10.18 on, on a road that was very close to the airport, he had strange interference on this cell phone call, which his record showed was, was about 10.18. Everything had been completely normal up until that time. There was no evidence on the controller's All right, having a little bit of a uh, uh, audio problem. Audio trouble from the live CBS Fox News press pool feed of the NTSB comes at a crucial moment in the pilot error official story narrative. A little bit of a uh, audio uh, problem. 10:18. There we go. Uh, at 10:19, this is again from radar. He was descending through 3,500 feet. Let's repeat Carol Carmody's statement, supplying the missing 17 words. Everything had been completely normal up until that time. There was no evidence on the controller's part. Or from the pilot's voice, no difficulty, no reported problems, no expression of concern. An electromagnetic weapon would... Um, would explain a number of these things. Inspector, can, can I ask you a question about some of the technology that you're developing to fight the war on terror, specifically directed energy and high-powered microwave technology? Do you, uh, when do you envision that you can weaponize that type of technology? Mm -hmm. Goodness, um, it is. It is in, for the most part, the kinds of things you're talking about are in varying early stages. Uh, I think they are in early stages and, and, and probably not ready uh, for employment at this point. In, in the normal order of things, when you invest in research and development and begin a developmental project, uh, you don't have any intention or expectations that one would use it. On the other hand, the real world intervenes from time to time and you reach in there and take something out that is still in a developmental stage and you might use The real world intervenes from time to time and you reach in there and take something out that is still in a developmental stage and you might use it. Uh, after 9-11, um, uh, I haven't written about this yet, but the, the Central Intelligence Agency was very deeply involved in domestic activities against people they thought to be enemies of the state without any legal authority for it. They haven't been called on it yet. Um, that does happen. Um, right now, today, there was a story in the New York Times that, if you read carefully, mentioned something known as the Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC it's called, is a special wing of our special operations community that is set up independently. They do not report to anybody except in, in the Clinton, uh, in the uh, Bush-Cheney days, they reported directly to the Cheney, Cheney office. 
They do not report to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or to Mr. Gates, the Secretary of Defense. They report directly to him. Congress has no oversight of it. It's an executive assassination wing, essentially. And it's been going on and on and on. I asked him how his week had been, and he said his week had been tough. The Vice President Cheney called me in and told me to get on their bandwagon or there'd be serious ramifications in Minnesota. And to stop sticking my nose into the 9-11, we're going to get to the bottom of this. There is, there is something going on. It is being portrayed. It's being blowed out. And he said, we're going to get to the bottom of it. When he made the statement to us about uh, Dick Cheney calling him in, there were about 10 veterans standing around with us. He spoke about the 9-11 to the veterans. And then when, when, when I spoke with him, he said, Pat, there are so many things going on in 9-11 that just don't make sense. He knew then at Wilmer that the 9-11 was staged. I believe that Wellstone was after 9-11.